Hello, BookTube. And welcome back to our read-along for 2024, Frank Herbert's masterpiece, Dune. Uh, widely acclaimed as one of the greatest science fiction novels of all time, it tells the story of the downfall of a noble house in a far future star-spanning imperium, the House of Atreides, which is ordered to go to the planet Dune and take it over from House Arconan, but unbeknownst to them, or maybe beknownst to them, there's not much they can do about it, House Arconan has set a trap for them with the help of the Imperium's Emperor uh, to destroy House Atreides. Move them into a trap they can't resist and then destroy them. And it seems to work. Duke Leto Atreides is killed. His retainers are either captured or scattered to the winds. And for all that anybody knows, his son and heir, Paul Atreides, and his lady, the Lady Jessica of the Bene Gesserit, are lost in a sandstorm. Uh, lost to the, the ferocious, unforgiving elements of the desert planet Dune. We know that's not true. Paul and Jessica have survived. More than that, although their survival was completely alone and completely forlorn for a bit, they have now made an alliance. An alliance that will be absolutely crucial for the rest of this book, the rest of this series, and in the continuity, the rest of the life of this Imperium. With the Fremen the native people of the deserts of dune who live in scattered tribes and communities and live by the knife and are hated by and hunted by the harkonnen people uh the fremen have a, a band of fremen under stilgar leader of the fremen who paul has met before uh have fallen under his countenance as he puts it he has decided that the tribe will teach them the ways of the desert and keep them alive rather than take their water uh and Jessica is watchful about this. She's very protective of her son. But it seems that she can trust Stilgar. It seems that they have achieved, temporarily anyway, a kind of safety. As safe as the Fremen can be when they are hunted for sport by the Harkonnen. Uh, this allows her to sleep. Badly needed, unguarded sleep. <laughs> in a hammock, in, in a, a rock enclosure that the Fremen are staying in during the day. During the heat of the day. Uh, and that brings us to the scene that we get to today where she wakes up to a commotion this is a tightly controlled scene it's extremely exciting it's the exact opposite of the last scene that we read uh, the commotion involves a Fremen that we've met a few times Jamis is his name when Paul and Jessica are originally confronted by a band of Fremen Jamis pulls a weapon on Paul and is disabled and knocked unconscious for his trouble Paul is a 15 year old boy he's small for his age but he's been trained by the best not only the Duke's war masters but Jessica in the unarmed combat techniques of the Bene Gesserit there's no chance at all that this Fremen was going to be able to defeat him in unarmed combat even armed combat Jamis has a weapon on him Paul easily dissembles him uh, and when Jamis wakes back up Stilgar thinks, well, it will do you good as a moral lesson if I put you partly in charge of Paul to make sure about his safety. Maybe I can mend the rift between the two of you, but that's not going to happen. Jessica sees this right away. She sees right away that she should have been paying more attention to Jamis' personality because he's the vengeful, brooding type. Stilgar says it when she asks what's going on. Stilgar says that Jamis has challenged her to combat, and she can't fight. She, in, according to the rules of the Fremen, she needs a champion, which will of course be Paul, her son. Uh, it, it, Stilgar says right in front of Jamis, yeah, he's he's always had this kind of weird, vaguely uncontrollable temper. It makes him somewhat valuable in a fight, but it means he'll never be a leader. It means he'll always be substandard, poor material. Uh, it's infuriating for Jamis to hear, and Jamis has enough in, intelligence to realize that Stilgar is saying this out loud in front of everyone, although apparently just in conversation with Jessica, specifically so that it will anger Jamis to challenge Stilgar, so that Stilgar can put an end to this one rebellious tribe member without bothering anyone, without bothering these two strangers, who he feels have an interwoven destiny of something greater than just being members of his tribe. You can sense that he feels that. And that Jamis is getting in the way of all of this. Better if Jamis feels personally insulted by him, Stilgar, and they fight. But Jamis has enough self-control to want to take it out on Paul, the kid who knocked him unconscious and took his weapon. Uh, Jessica at first bridles at this. She could easily defeat Jamis herself. This is not a question of 
um, 21st century take charge girl bosses who don't need no man, five foot tall heroines in modern Hollywood action movies that toss around seven foot tall armed mercenaries with no explanation given. The explanation is that here is that the Bene Gesserit train from girlhood in the, con the absolute control of their bodies and also in a, a huge suite of unarmed combat techniques. It's not that Jessica is a superwoman, it's that she's an adept of the Bene Gesserit. And they are, as I've, as I've mentioned many times before, the irony of the tensions in the first part of this book with Duncan Idaho and Gurney Halleck and Thufir Hawat is that the Lady Jessica, who none of them completely trust, could defeat any of them in single combat, probably all of them together. It's just Herbert doesn't put a lot of stress on it, but she knows that, that her instinct is to protect her son by tearing apart jammies on her own and stilgar tells her well you know i know that that i can't physically stop you because you can defeat me but you can't defeat all of us and we know also that you have the weirding way we know that is their their fremen for term for what jessica is indeed doing the, the Bene Gesserit have a technique called the voice they gain your register they learn the the register of your voice and your vocal mannerisms and use it they imprint it once they have it they can use their own language, their own voice pitched in a certain way, to control you. It's an incredibly dangerous weapon. Thufir Hawad is astonished when he sees it in action. It's done on him. Uh, and Stilgar is not wrong. She is imprinting Jamis right away to have the ultimate trump card. I'm not going to let you kill my son, even if all these people kill me. I'm still going to stop him from doing that. But she realizes that this should happen. If they're going to be trusted by these people, this combat should happen. It's unclear to me whether or not she knows that the combat must be ritually to the death. Paul does not know that. He agrees to fight Jamis, and in very little time he demonstrates to Jamis and to everyone watching that he is in absolutely no danger. He is so superior to Jamis in, unarmed, in, in knife combat, having been trained to it since childhood by the best there is that he can afford to be leisurely. It looks to the watching Fremen like he's playing with Jamis, humiliating him. It's not that. As Paul points out in this chapter, it's that I didn't want to kill him. <laughs> That's all. I wasn't playing with him. I just didn't want to kill him. When they have their first pass, when Paul draws first blood, he says, do you yield? And that's when he learns from Stilgar that this combat is to the death and that he has to kill a man the first time that he's had to do that, just to intentionally kill a man in combat. Um, and he does. It's it's a tense moment. It, he seems at first a little bit sluggish. He is, after all, accustomed to training in knife combat with a shield. With the ener the personal energy shields that exist in, in the world of Dune. That block fast-moving attacks. And, and allow slow-moving attacks. It creates a whole combat style on its own, and Paul has been trained in that style. But he doesn't have a shield. Of course, they, none of the Fremen have shields. The shields drive worms crazy, so you don't have them. Uh, it's not a big obstacle. It slows Paul down just a little. The thing that's slowing him down much more than that is his growing prescience. His growing ability to be subsumed with all the different future pathways that his life could take. His increased exposure to the Spice Melange is increasing those abilities against his he's not trying to do it but he sees many things now clearer and clearer never more so than in this chapter they become really clear in this chapter two things one his death in a knife fight the details are blurry he doesn't have full full prescience yet the details are blurry but he knows that there is a, there is a major forking pathway in his own future site in which he dies in a knife fight now we're more than halfway through this book if you've read this book before you know that that prescience is not wrong that that foresight the foresight that image of the possibility of dying in a knife fight is going to happen at the end of this book the climax of this book it's not this but paul has no way of knowing that that's one of the things that's becoming clearer and clearer to him in these visions that are sharpening due to his exposure to Spice. The other thing is his terrible purpose, which he sees clearly in this chapter and says to himself, must never happen. 
which is the Fremen banner, the Atreides banner, at the head of unstoppable legions of Fremen warriors, subduing and brutalizing the whole of the galaxy. Uh, he sees that vision clearer and clearer. This chapter is the first one where we see it in such clarity. And those visions, both of them, are slowing him down a little, but it's not enough to save poor, brutish, loudmouth, resentful Jamis. He is killed rather easily. Uh, and his body is taken away so that his water can be rendered for the tribe. And it's a delicate moment. His mother does not want Paul to like this experience. She scorns him for it. Stilgar scorns him for it by because Stilgar has been disgusted by what he thinks is Paul toying with someone, which is totally not the Fremen way. It's only later, when a moment later, when Stilgar and everyone else realizes, oh, he wasn't toying with him, he just didn't want to hurt him, uh, that that resentment goes away. But by then, thankfully, Paul has been reminded by his mother and everyone else that this is a sordid business. It's not anything you're supposed to like doing. This is a path that will lead him away from becoming a character we're going to meet called Fade Rotha. Uh, we're going to see Fade Rotha in his glory in just a little bit, and Fade never had anyone tell him that lesson. He, had, he never had anyone scorn him for his first kill. Uh, and it's made him a monster. And it, the irony of this chapter is that Jessica is trying to stop Paul from becoming a monster who likes killing, while in Paul's visions, the ultimate monstrosity is being done in his name. <laughs> Literally in his name, because we learn that he must ha have a name in the tribe, a private name among the Fremen, but also a public name. Uh, his, his, his private name becomes Usul, the mouse at the base of the pillar, uh, the name that, we, that he hears the girl Chani call him in a, in a dream long before he comes to do. Uh, but his public name, he chooses another little rodent, a hopping little mouse, a resourceful little creature called Muadib. That will be his public name, Paul Muadib. Uh, and again, if you're reading this for the first time, that's where you're going to encounter this and, and not think much of it. And if you're reading this for the 400th time, as I am, you're struck with the amazing portentousness of it, that this is when Muadib is literally born. Uh, in blood, in a knife fight. Uh, and that is this chapter. Marvelously counterbalanced against another knife fight between two men later in the book. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff uh, that, among other things, shows us that the stakes are incredibly high here. It's not just those legions of Fremen in the future, in a possible future. It's that the stakes are very high with the Fremen just in general. They live with death every day. And they have now accepted Paul and Jessica into their ranks. Things are going to move faster from this point out. So, so uh, we'll wrap this up for now. We'll move on to the next chapter next time. Uh, and I'll see you then. Thank you, Booktube.